Hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of the Drunk Friend Podcast. As always, we're your host, I'm Travis, joined by Alex. Hello Alex. What's up man? How you been? Good. What's going on? Good. You sound different. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me man. I'm... My brain is fried. Uh, what's going on is that I'm moving next week, so we're getting everything organized, reviewing stacks of papers, which are thankfully digital, but still no less, no no less uh, less fun. I'm not phrasing that properly, but it sucks, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. It is exciting to move into a new house, but the uh, the process is very time consuming and stressful. But, yeah. um that's why I just squat in abandoned houses. There's no paperwork. You can be there for a while before they find you. So try that. Yeah, but then you gotta like start fires to keep warm and nah. uh yeah. And you're 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 you know, staying you know, waking up in the morning by lighting used cigarette butts on <laughs> what you find on the ground and in the gutter. Like that that might get old after a while. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's exciting. I think it's exciting. Speaking of exciting, we also have a guest today, and this time we're not bringing them in in the middle of the show. We're not forcing you to just hear Alex and I talk about YouTube for 20 minutes before we get to the exciting part. No! We have the guest on here from the start, and it's, of course, Michelle, a.k.a. Petey, from Petey's Power Hour, the new podcast on our network. Hello, Michelle. How are you? Hello. I am fantastic. Thank you for having me. Thank you for... Well, we ha we'll get to this, but thank you for, and I don't know how the steps go, but finding us on the internet, sending us an email, joining our Discord, not leaving us alone, asking for a podcast, getting a podcast, asking for it to be on the network, getting it on the network, and then ending up here. Thank you. <laughs> wow. You, were you, was, was that your auctioneering bit there, Trav? Jeez. I've been listening crazy. to a lot of Genovi. He's very good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thanks, Petey, for coming on. You're, I listen to your uh latest mini sode this morning uh which measures tito's vodka versus gray goose vodka and i am not a vodka person just like yourself trav is yeah but i kind of ruined vodka for myself at a, at a young age um i'm just kind of sick of it i just don't not a huge fan i never really was a huge fan but um i was interested to hear uh the differences that you were able to spot between the two drinks between the two spirits, no less, I should say. I should be fancy around here. We have no a, fancy. we have a, an, <laughs> well, well, I was going to say we have an educated, uh, highly educated. We got a doctor in here, and then we've got like a doctor of alcohol, of drink, a mix, <laughs> mixology in here, and then we got me. So, yeah, you're Dr. Uh, Sniss. One of these things is not like the other. I'm the doctor of thugonomics, just like uh, John Cena. <laughs> That's what I am. Uh, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the doctor of being white is what i am but, uh... <laughs> but yes michelle thank you so much for joining us and uh you know this we felt like you could you could be on from the beginning because this is like the olive garden episode when you hear your family of course so you know we felt like we could have you on here go through the emails go through the youtube stuff and you'd hang right in so thanks again so let's let's jump into that a little bit uh snes drunk you've so because you're moving, it's still fascinating to me. You always downplay it. You're like, yeah, man, I just play the games, make videos, man. That's all I do. Been doing it for years. Ain't no thing. But you've been cranking yeah, man, out. Ain't no like, thing. I just make the games, play the videos. That's all I do. And you just go out, make plays, get off the field you. and third down. That's what I'm don't talking turn about. Turn the ball over. That's you. You you have that coach speak. But I'm telling you, man, it's really impressive. You cranked out two list style videos that uh I think are, are really impressive. I don't know how it is that you're able to crank these out at the short order that at the pace and with the with the amount of things going on around you that you're able to do it. But good games in un unexpected places part four. Are you out of unexpected places? Have you looked under the pillow? <laughs> Never. Uh, still got to go between the couch cushions and all that. Um, I really like that s making those series of games because um, it gives me an excuse to look at stuff like game game gear. Mm -hmm uh master system and uh what's what's the other big one that i like oh uh, uh neo geo pocket my roommate back in the day had a neo geo pocket and i was fascinated by that thing because it wasn't you know it was an snk machine i was like where did this come from he's like i got it to blah 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 to... i forget where he got it like one of those used game stores somebody brought it in maybe i don't know but he had one and he had like six or seven games with it and um the the game that stuck out to me at the time was uh, Bust a Move, otherwise known as Puzzle Bobble. Yeah, and it was really impressive. It was a, it was damn good. The screen was really high quality. Well, not really high quality, but it was better than Game Gear. That's for damn sure. Um, and it looked great. 
it's I want to get one myself one of these days. And uh, yeah, no, I just like tooling around and finding stuff that's uh, you might not expect. Yeah, and it it seems a bit like an almost like an evergreen video idea because there's tons of quote unquote hidden gems out there on a number of different consoles. So it seems like something you know that's you know the the other video you did is like you know 13 hardest bosses on the Super Nintendo. That you know you could run that well dry, but there's always going to be weird places to find good games. Well, Trev, you know we just got done dealing with Metal Jesus's lawyers, and now we're going to be hearing from him again because I know, of I... that the unauthorized use of hidden I know, gems. I know. So it's, I'm sorry. You got us in trouble again. Yeah, I know. With John Riggs on here, I couldn't help myself. You're going to have to cut that out. But um, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, and plus and this goes back to when I first started the channel. It's satisfying a, a childhood curiosity where what is the 3DO? What is the Philips CDI? What are these things? What are these games like? And, you know, the, where I'm from, there used to be a place called Funko Land, which sadly got bought by GameStop mm -hmm. uh, sometime in the late 90s, I think. And they would have these uh, lists, these ginormous lists of every game they would carry in stock or could potentially have in stock from trade-in. And um, they had a price next to it, too. And every time they had, like, Neo Geo or 3DO or any of that stuff, they were always, like, wildly overexpensive, like, just crazy prices. And I always wondered, like, what what is this stuff and why is it so expensive and now i have an opportunity to like go find it i have an excuse to go like find the stuff and play it and not only that arcade stuff is is awesome too like in that video you mentioned mm. um the first game i tackled was called firefox and apparently it's based on a movie called firefox which i've never heard of in my life which was based on the browser yeah <laughs> apparently based on the browser but way, way back in 1983 which uh, is is very strange, but um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's uh, is a laser disc game akin to uh, Dragon's Lair, and so it manages to blend you know your regular point and shoot uh, afterburner style uh, video game stuff where you're flying an airplane, but the background is all like movie, like laser disc movie footage where you're flying through the mountains and stuff like that it's pretty freaking cool that is cool like and especially for 1983 i can't imagine how cool that must have looked back then but yeah yeah i love stuff like that i'll, I'll never get sick of finding crazy stuff like that that's uh that's completely new to me so yeah and it's fun to share it you know below the oven there's that thing that stores like all your pans and shit have you checked there for any games that's an unexpected well, place. Well, it's funny, you know, we have we have a gas oven and when we first ah. moved into this house where we are now, you know, I I usually put oven mitts under there, sure. but I had never lived with a gas oven before and <laughs> like you see you lived with it like you talked to it and sometimes it paid I the rent. To everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's my friend. <laughs> you guys know that's not supposed to be for storage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh i did not know that so uh it turns out when we preheated the oven we thought something was wrong with the oven because there was a lot of smoke hmm. and it turns out my oven mitts were on fire so oh yeah that was fun i'm not familiar with the gas oven either so this was a very good psa yeah do not put stuff under there very good well then why let me ask you this Petey. why was it a drawer then yeah it's supposed to be like so for a, a warming place where you warm your foods like so say you bake a casserole or whatever you can put it down there to warm instead of and put something in the oven that's what the microwave is for yeah <laughs> and besides what if i wanted to warm my oven mitts <laughs> right point. i needed it warm just... mitts to grab the hot thing out of the oven that totally makes sense <laughs> checkmate michelle of course it does <laughs> michelle what's the most obscure console that that you either own or play Th speaking of unexpected places do you have anything weird? Oh, I'm so mainstream. It's not even funny. Oh, I mean, okay. growing up, I had a couple CDI stuff, but nothing. That, I mean, we had just a Super helps. Nintendo, PC, PlayStation. We're boring. <laughs> the CDI, that's, I mean, that's exotic. You almost made me spit up my vodka. That counts so hard. The CDI. Oh, you're just Very gonna... good. CDI wasn't even initially made for video games. It was originally made for like... Robert Maplethorpe, uh, whoa, pictures of flowers. <laughs> really? <laughs> Your Maplethorpe was not flowers. <laughs> 
Oh, he wasn't? Oh, oh here we go. Know. We got a doctor in art over here, too. Jesus Christ. No, so, Can't Maple... Can't keep up. Maple, Maplethorpe uh, did photos. I'd, 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 I'd need to validi- verify this, but yeah, I'm pretty sure... Maplethorpe did, like, porn. The first pornographic wow. photos. <laughs> Giving that a hard to Google right here on air, and she's right. <laughs> Am I? All right. It's, it's Maplethorpe, right? I got to get a CDI, it sounds like. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the name that comes up in my head when I think of like famous photographer for some reason. So forgive me if it's porn. <laughs> I mean, it is it is high end art, but it's very risque. <laughs> he keeps all of his porn stashed under his oven. God, Alex, you're a mess. All right, and then you did totally rad, which I don't know. You tell me, Alex, was it totally rad or just a little bit rad? It was mildly rad. Mildly rad. You know, <laughs> yeah, it was okay. Um, I mean, it's fine. It's one of those games where it's like. You know, uh, you go into it, you see what it is, and you're tempted to play it a certain way. It's like, oh, you just run to the right and shoot stuff. It's just like Mega Man, Contra, and all that stuff. You can't really do that with this game because the controls are kind of wonky. You got to stop and learn how to approach the game by, you know, its own way. So, mm. yeah. Once you do, once you get over that hump, it's fine. It's pretty good. Gotcha. Um, the pixel art for the bosses is super impressive. Like, that really Yeah, that looked good. Me. Yeah. There's like that fish boss that looks like something from a Darius game. Yeah. There's that uh, big Skeletor looking thing. And yeah, it was really pretty impressive. Like you can tell like actual effort went into that game. Unlike some other, you know, thrown together platformers on NESR. Yeah, it's got a few things going for it. It's kind of alluring. It's got an alluring cover art. The graphics look good. It just if it played a little bit better, it might have had a um, a bigger legacy. But hey. It's all right. Maybe it's overselling itself by being totally rad. Maybe if it was real and it was just like ki- kind of rad, this, this game, a little bit rad, it might have done better. Aggressively mediocre. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. sure that'll sell a lot of copies. Yeah. Which is, should have been the name of this podcast. Uh, I put out a <laughs> video on Wizards and Warriors. Can you believe it? Wizards and then also Warriors at the same time, same place, same time. And, uh, you know, it's long. It's a longer video, but I was due. So, what, so the first one is your favorite then, right? I think you said, or... Do you lean toward the second one? I think I like the first one most, but uh, I mean, if you like the first, the second one is very similar. You should like it too, by proxy. The third one you shouldn't like unless you're a masochist. I like what the third one tries. Yeah, it's just it just doesn't do it very well. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's too grueling. If it just had a little bit more forgiveness with continues and checkpoints, it would have been much much better. PD, have you played those games at all? No. <laughs> No. Good. No, you almost went Minnesota on me there. <laughs> no, I didn't play too much NES games growing up. I'm, I watched my mom play Zelda two and Zelda, and that's all the real memory I have besides maybe Mario of the NES. And mm. you know, so you're like you're not familiar with the cover of the second game, then? Oh, not yeah. super familiar, no. Okay, so are are you are you able to Google something right now? Because you need to see this. Um, because the second game, which, which is also has a subtitle of Iron Sword, uh, has a very famous cover, and it's for the ladies. Ooh! Oh! I mean, it's it, Fabio. It, it got me too. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's not just Fabio. It's Fabio and his gorgeous, flawless hair. Yeah, oh, he that is. Hair. Every time I see him, I think of the I can't believe it's not butter commercials. That's all I think about when I exactly. see him. <laughs> he is a snack. Uh, looks like he's wearing a championship belt in this picture. Like, what? What is he a champion of here besides butter? <laughs> champion of butter. That's uh, that's that's what he is. Is that what he slathers all over himself because he's all greasy and shiny? Yeah, no doubt. Takes that and uses it as. It's very volumizing for hair. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I, oh yeah, <laughs> that and like bird blood. Do you remember, I remember hearing a story once that he was on a roller coaster and he got <laughs> whacked by a bird while on the roller coaster, and he was like bloodied and disgusting. Wow. Like I don't know why that popped in my head. <laughs> There's pictures of that. <laughs> I have never heard of this. Wow, yeah, where are you, you been? Go, okay, now <laughs> now it's your turn to Google. You got to Google. Uh, I think he's. I think it was this freaking full on seagull. He was yeah. on a roller coaster, and they got to the top, and a seagull flew into his face. I think he broke his nose. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there was blood huh. 
coming out. I will say, if you Google Blood Fabio, it does come up. <laughs> Blood Perfect. Fabio, that's the name of my metal band's album. Perfect. From 1994. <laughs> yeah, he got wrecked by that thing. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that had to have hurt. That's got to be an omen or something. Like, you got to go to church after that, right? Uh, you you got to at least, uh, you know, perform a ritual in yeah. the basement or something. Or start a church. That seems like a good premise to just have your own at that point. All right. So Wizards and Warriors. Kind of good, kind of not. Eh. All right. But then, here's the here's the, the video of, of, of the day right here. This is 13 hardest uh, SNES boss fights. And Alex, I was impressed. You hardly got any comments about this. I expected people to come out oh just God. swinging. But it seems like, once again, nobody cares about your opinions on what's hard or not. It's kind of a shame. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, you know, we, we like to talk about, like, how the sausage is made for YouTube stuff. If you ever want to uh, get a popular YouTube video, all you got to do is just bring up whether something is or isn't hard. Uh, just talk about difficulty. On, and, and make sure to talk in declarative sentences too. None of this, none of these qualifiers like maybe or I think. No, you have to you have to speak declaratively, and you have to make sure you know you sound like an authority on something, even if you're just some guy like me. It's like, well, I I, I had trouble with with this, this, and this. Well, actually, you're totally wrong because it's very easy <laughs> boss fight. It's like. Um, there were 12, okay, we're, how many hours, we're, okay, th- now 13 hours removed from the original posting of the video at 5 a.m. Mountain Time. We're at 821 comments, <laughs> and about, um, I would say 65% of them have the word, if I were to search the word, come on, like as one word, C apostrophe M O N. Uh, that would bring up like most of the comments because it's mostly people going, "Come on, it's not that hard," or "Come on, where's this game?" or "Where's this boss?" And it's it's it it never fails. It's it all. Oh, it's I have a one hundred percent success rate with getting <laughs> pissing people off and getting people's attention with video game difficulty. And it's like, ugh, it, 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 that's all you got to do. It's it's that simple. I've got the algorithm figured out, folks. Yeah, man. I I do think it's a good idea that if you are having trouble with any of these bosses just posting this, you'll get tons of tips. People are coming out here with all kinds of good strats. I mean, it seems like everybody knows how to beat it, but you. It's pretty impressive. Well, especially if you're going into this stuff blind. Like, you know, when I first discovered um, uh, the Kulex fight in Mario RPG, first of all, I was like, why isn't the whole game like this? Because this is awesome. And then second, as I got the crap kicked out of me immediately, it's like, oh, it's just a simple matter of applying the lazy shell on Princess Peach. And just, <laughs> like, why would I do that? Like, what is my incentive to, to come to the, that conclusion? Ugh. And I don't know. Some people act like it's the most obvious thing ever. And it's like, you know what? It's not. It's, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I see some of these comments from some of these people. Guys like, oh, 52 seconds in, I've already disagreed more than once. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I guess you win something. I don't know what, though. Ah, I love those videos, personally. I think they're fun. So, good job. Thanks for doing them. Petey, what is the hardest... Here, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you a, a good one here. Okay. The hardest... The, the game you had, the, the Final Fantasy game you had the most trouble with. <laughs> um is there like is there like a battle in particular that like really tripped you up? I would probably say <laughs> Now, I'm going to get a lot of gripe for this because as a kid, the hardest battle that I remember is Final Fantasy 4 or 2, and that was the king battle at the towards the towards the end where you fight it, it, I think his name was King and when the Crystal Palace thing I remember mm-hmm. trying over and over and over again that stupid battle, and I at like after like the fifth or sixth try, I was like, "Oh my god, finally I did it!" You know, ten year old me or how, however old I was, like. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great feeling, though. Yes, King it Behemoth, was fantastic. Is that his name? Yes. He, well, he turns into King Behemoth, but he starts off as just King, and then it goes into King Behemoth. Yes, I. I mean, Final Fantasy IV loves those transition battles. Um. But yeah, I remember having trouble with that guy. Not even the last bo- boss, just that guy. <laughs> I was going to say, you didn't have any trouble with Zeromus or however you say that? No, I just remember th- that Not guy really. specifically. 
<laughs> nice. See, I like these answers that are that are uh, a little under the radar. It reminds me of like uh, one of your favorites, PD Tony Gwynn. Oh yeah, he, um, look at this. <laughs> uh, there you go. You got the the Padres gear on. Yeah. I remember when he was asked. Um, you know, he's one of the greatest hitters in baseball history, and he mm-hmm. was asked, like, what pitcher gives you the most trouble? And you know, everybody's expecting him to say, like, I don't know, Greg Maddox, Randy Johnson, Pedro Martinez. His answer was Danny Darwin. And I don't even like, know who that why is. Why Danny Darwin? It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, he's he's just some. If you Google him, he looks like you know your dad's friend that works at the gas station or something. Like he's <laughs> yeah. one of those like old school baseball players that does not look like a professional athlete. Well, at that all. is Curly from the seventy, the G- Gulf seventy six. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got the he's got the killer mustache dude he does but yeah and Gwen, tony Gwynn went on to explain like yeah it's just the way the ball comes out of his hand it's the angle i can't see the ball until at the very last possible second um he just gives me it's it's the arm angle it's it's all sorts of stuff and i, th- I always think that's kind of cool wow so uh in other words king is your danny darwin yes Although it doesn't have That's as good crazy. as his mustache. Danny Darwin but... was 171 and 182. <laughs> That's incredible. He was so mediocre, but he owned Tony Gwynn. <laughs> Glad we got Danny. We finally had an excuse to talk Danny Darwin on here. We've been oh, talking about it for dying. weeks, and I'm finally glad we got it in. Yeah. He also went by the nickname Dr. Death. <laughs> wow. <That's> awesome. <laughs> Somebody must have just put that on there as a joke. There's no way that's true. I don't know. Doctor Death does not. Doctor Death does not look like a, a mechanic. Looks like MacGyver's <laughs> stepdad. I don't know. It's cool though. All right. So that's that's what's been happening on YouTube. So there you go. And the good and PD about your answer with um, Final Fantasy two slash four. We don't get a lot of the well actually folk here in the podcast realm. Uh, so I think you're in the clear. But um, if you want, we can we can say, hey, if you're upset with what PD said, you can go ahead and send an email to drunkfriendpodcast@gmail.com. We'll forward it to you if you if you want. Absolutely. All right. So <laughs> because you are the drinking extraordinaire, the drink, you're into the drink. We got to ask, uh, what are you drinking tonight? Well, I spilled a little bit of it just a second ago, but <laughs> I am having a Kentucky Flyer, which is one of my favorite cocktails right now. And what goes in that? Rye whiskey, Luxardo maraschino liqueur, lemon juice, and a cocktail cherry. That's it. Very fancy. So fancy. I consider a drink fancy if it has more than two ingredients, and it, even if one of those ingredients is ice. <laughs> yeah. What 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 about uh, yeah? And, and one of those ingredients isn't like Gatorade or something. <laughs> Ew. Gross. What are you making with Gatorade? <laughs> Vodka Gatorade, that's what we did come back, on! <laughs> that's, those are that's what you did in a, back in the day, like tech school days, college days. Was just like, yeah, let's pour some, uh, you know, vodka Gatorade, and then mix up some. I don't know, I forget. We just mixed whatever we had. I mean, as a tailgating concoction, I get it. I thought you were spending your adult Saturday evenings with orange Gatorade and whiskey. So I'm and red and pour some Red Bull in there for good measure. You got sure. Well, you got to get the heart going. Can't fall asleep. So, PD, I also listened to your vodka podcast this morning, and um, mm-hmm. I actually had sent an email ahead of time for that podcast because I, I needed to, I kind of needed to write the ship on it. I knew it was going to go to a place I didn't want it to go. I knew it was going to go to Hater Town because I know you're a hater of the tater when it comes to mm. the vodka. And uh, mm-hmm. huge vodka fan here. I'm actually mostly vodka, and I'm drinking vodka right now. I'm basically just drinking vodka and olive juice because... I basically crawled out from a swamp as a when I was born, and so that's what I enjoy. So and that's what I'm having right now. And I I don't usually I haven't been drinking on podcasts for a while. I'm only doing this because you're here. So, oh, thank you. Yes, I'm only drinking. <laughs> I make my, people drink. That's that's encouraging. I'm only drinking my very briny <laughs> swill because you're here tonight. So I appreciate it. Great. <laughs> you said olive juice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It gets a, it gets a little salt a in dirty there. Dirty martini. Very dirty. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, there's olives in there too. I didn't just. I didn't <laughs> just many? get the juice. Like six. Yeah, there's. Uh, let me see. Let me count here. There's, there's five. Oh, over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was. You shouldn't have said. I was going to set an over. Oh. Under <laughs> <and> <laughs> I didn't eat one already, <laughs> so there was six. 
Oh my over God. Under four and a half. I'm going. I'm pound, pounding the over. There we go. Alex, are you partaking in anything this evening? Uh, I need to be responsible for the next <laughs> couple weeks because of work, uh, because of all the stuff I have to do regarding moving and signing piles and piles of papers. Yes. Good God. But um, all that good stuff. But um, yeah, no, I'm just having chamomile tea. Oh, that's right. I remember that was why you relate. That's fun. And water. That's cool. Well, good for you, man. And, you know, maybe once you get the carpal tunnel from signing hundreds of documents, you'll be able to celebrate and uh, hopefully staves off some of the pain with some alcohol a bit later. But I wanted to ask you, Michelle, because the reason that we know about you is a reason that or a way that a lot of people can contact this show, which is through drunkfriendpodcast at gmail.com. You you just happen to send an email there one day and... um now suddenly you're on the show several months later you you've it's been kind of weird in that you've gone from just someone who listened to a shitty podcast to actually having your own very good podcast so now your competition Mm -hmm. um do you email every podcast you listen to with the hopes of one day becoming its rival absolutely that's how how'd you figure out my game (laughs) i've seen it play that's 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 also a little suspicious i think this was her plan (laughs) the whole time (laughs) no oh my gosh no i actually never written to anything ever before and i was like you know what i like these guys i'm gonna email them and just let let them know i like them and then all of a sudden it just went all downhill from there like you guys read it on the episode and i was like well i guess i have to like join their discord now i mean (laughs) jeez so yeah, you brought the heat though. You you brought the the recipes, uh, uh, the dr- <laughs> the drinks, and all that stuff. Um, you you got us a a really good aviator, uh, recipe that we went nuts with. Oh, good. Um, and introduced uh, aviator gin to us, and that was delicious. Along with uh, all those all those mixers, we still have We're, we we have just barely enough. I think yeah, maybe Thanksgiving night we might have to finish off have a celebratory round of a couple aviators just to finish off those bottles so we're not lugging around, <laughs> you know, like bottles with one sixteenth of fluid in them because I would feel kind of sad. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, the thing is, is that you know your stuff. Like, it's not like, oh, yeah, we're <laughs> hello, person that likes us. Thank you for liking us so much. <laughs> we appreciate it so much that you can have your own podcast. Please take it. But no, you you actually you actually know your stuff um, inside and out, uh, like right off the top of your head for one thing. So, and you've accumulated all this knowledge over the years. Can you tell us a little bit, like, about your background in wh- whether it's? Uh, I think you you said you worked at a. Uh, um, I don't want to say the name of the store, but um, at a certain retailer that is, uh, I would call him a big box retailer, but with alcohol does that make sense <laughs> actually no i never worked in big, a big corporate box retail shop before oh. um well then i'm t- i'm totally wrong even better <laughs> actually. no i didn't work at total wine well, actually, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no i got my started i got started into alcohol in like 2008 ish i'd like just got out of college i had a job with my in my degree and it was 2008 and life sucked because the economy was tanking. So I got laid off and I was like, oh, my God, what the hell am I going to do? So I started working in restaurants and I'd always loved like food and stuff like that. And then my boyfriend took me to a winery in Virginia and I was hooked working in a restaurant, seeing all these like high end cocktails, going to a winery and like seeing the wine at its location. I was like, well, OK, how do I get make this my career? So. I started like at the restaurant I was working at, which was a Jose Andreas restaurant um, in downtown DC. They had the managers would have tasting lessons with the staff, so the staff could learn like about how um, how you taste wine, how you sell wine, what are the wines we have in stock that you know how do you sell them and how do you pair them with food and such. So it was really cool and a good like introductory. So I started taking classes with the it's called the WSET, which is Wine Spirits and Education Trust, and started off at like level two, and then a couple of years later I got into level three, and it goes as high as 
we'll call it level five. Level five is master of wine, which like I know 150 people in the world have. You have to get invited to take the test. So I stopped at, I was starting to do level four and decided that it, I didn't want to do it anymore, <laughs> um, those classes. So that's where I left off pretty much. And I went from restaurants into retail so I, and, and wine distribution. So I pretty much worked in every aspect of selling in the business. Hmm. So regarding the leveling, is mm -hmm. there a lot of grinding involved in that or is it pretty well balanced <laughs> or do they send you out in caves to slay monsters? Uh, do you have, are you responsible for your own equipment? Like, how does that work? No, they provide the equipment. All we have to do is just be able to grind and be able to level up using and they provide the bosses as well. So it's just oh, a matter excellent. of how well you can um, strategize your opponents. <laughs> right. Right on. Do you get to venture through with a party or is it solo? No, it's solo runs. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wishing, Alex, that you, since you asked that question, I'm like, we, have, we should have structured every interview as if we're basing them on video game questions. But it's too late now. We're 34 uh, episodes in. We have to just do what we've done. Um, so we got to retcon everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We do. So, Michelle, did you, I mean, you know, I, I keep jumping back to the podcast thing, but, mm. you know, Petey's Power Hour, obviously, it's on our network. You can go to polykill.com and find it. Is is podcasting something, I mean, I, I never really hear you talk about listening to other podcasts. Is is podcasting even something that was on your radar pre-2020? Did you ever think that you would find yourself behind a microphone doing what you're doing now and sharing with everyone your the knowledge that you've you've picked up along the way? Or... Is this a, as a, a big surprise to you as well? Oh my god, this is a huge surprise to me. I never thought I would get back into like editing soft, ed editing anything anymore. Like it's just, I, I never thought I would get back into this. When you say editing anymore, you're referencing. I guess you went to in school in college. You were taking yeah. some some courses on was it video editing and that kind of thing. Yeah, I majored in video production. In media production is my official major. Do you do any video production? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Not anymore. So it's been like 15 years or however long it's been since I've actually done anything. So like it's like riding a bicycle, right? Like getting back onto, onto the bike and trying to get back into a rhythm with editing and such. I mean, obviously the software and such is completely different, but the concepts are still the same. Mm -hmm. So... That's, you know, I'd never thought I would be back into it in a million years. That's funny. I was kind of in the same boat where I went to school for graphic design and I got, I went that, which promptly went nowhere immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I got trapped in like call center jobs and stuff. And it was just, my twenties were just, <laughs> just miserable. And because I wanted to be a musician, I wanted to write my own music and, you know, I played guitar and I made arrangements and that sort of thing and recorded all a lot of my own stuff and it none of it went anywhere. Um, but um, eventually when it, the YouTube thing I, I wanted to do, it's like, oh, I get to summon these ancient skills again, d you know, blowing the dust off this uh, giant textbook, you know, like it's like I'm Gandalf or something. But um, <laughs> the, the, th the frustrating thing for me, though, was that... Um, <laughs> a lot of video editing stuff uh, made a significant quantum leap forward from when I was using them in 2002 compared to when I started in 2013. Did you have the same trouble where it's like you have to relearn a lot of the software? Oh my gosh, yes. I download yeah. I downloaded Reaper and I was like, wait, what is this? <laughs> How do I do this again? Like, oh my god, it was such it was there was such a learning curve. I mean, once once i once once you like figure out the settings and the new features and such it, it all became much easier but getting past that hurdle was so like ugh, gut wrenching yeah. <laughs> that makes sense i have no experience my experience with video editing is basically just watching other people's things on youtube and just taking notes and wondering like how did they do that how how did they make this happen so i don't have any qualified school in like you nerds <laughs> Oh well. Okay, doctor. <laughs> yeah, well, right. I wasn't I'm not learned to do anything fun. See, I I just said I'm not learned. Like like I've got a degree in something. <laughs> so there you go. Anybody, if you pay a school long enough, they'll eventually give you a degree to get you out of there. 
That's what happened to me. <laughs> so, Michelle, can you describe the podcast a little bit? What's the format? I mean, I think we've shared with the folks that listen to this show. Of course, Alex and I have been on that podcast. But sort of take us through like what people can expect when they hit play on that thing. Yeah. So first I do a derpy introduction and a little <laughs> oh, it's intro. Not derpy. Come on. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it is. Like I try to come up with like little bits. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm annoyed with this week. Like when people are really like angsty about like tasting wine that are not doing it right or having thinking that canned wine is bad or, or anything like that. Like I, I'll talk about what are my gripes about the industry because there's such a huge misconception about alcohol and how snobby and you know that got that stigma against it and then i always have a guest unless it's a mini episode i guess but i always have a guest and typically they are content creators like you guys for video games because i love video games mm -hmm. and the guest gets to choose whatever they want to learn about and talk about so and I provide them the alcohol and we go through fun little history lessons they provide fun facts that I give them ahead of time so it's a more of a conversation versus just a spew of facts of information about just one thing and then we taste it and see if we like it it's pretty much it I think <laughs> it's it's actually very well done and I love the uh I, I love your stance on a lot of that stuff, too, because I had the same thought going in, especially surrounding wine culture and even beer culture to a degree, is that it's there's mm -hmm. just such an element. And, and maybe this goes back to the comment section in, in Alex's YouTube. There's a lot of, well, actually, out there with nerds. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess it's just nerd culture in general. People that are passionate about something, they want to put gates up around it, not let, not let anyone else in to enjoy it. And you tear a lot of that down. You say, look, it doesn't matter if you like this or not. It doesn't matter if you can taste or smell or sense every Every little ingredient they put on the bottle if you if you taste a cigarette butt hey that's what you tasted <laughs> doesn't mean that it's in there this just that's your opinion and i really appreciated that it kind of opened me up a little bit more to to the whole thing so you do a really good job and i'm very um i'm very appreciative of how open you are to to that kind of thing it's 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 very friendly to novices or folks that are just looking for a new hobby or looking to learn a little bit more and, and they don't want to have to go through the, am I doing it right? Am I saying it right? You do a really good job of tearing all yeah, that stuff down. It's um, normalizing a lot of the highfalutin uh, stuff around, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wine and stuff like that, which is much appreciated, especially for, you know, somebody uh, like me that doesn't know anything. You know, it's like, give me my whiskey. It's all I need. <laughs> pouring it you know just yeah. down the hatch you know that's um but i i have noticed with the podcast that uh you haven't done a have you done a beer episode yet no y are you are you much of a beer person <laughs> not really no i i to be perfectly honest i'm pretty minimal in terms of my knowledge of beer uh, it's that's a whole nother animal that I just didn't have enough brain energy to function with. Like I had the wine and the liquor in my head, but I just couldn't fit the beer in. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided, you know what, we're going to stick with wine and liquor and that's it. Because beer people are really, really excited and really love their beer and know every little thing whether it's what kind of hops they use and what temperature they they create the mashes at and i'm like i don't know is it a sour <laughs> <laughs> you know like i just didn't have enough energy and effort to go into beer where so much of my passion was with wine and with liquor so unfortunately i i might sneak in a beer episode Maybe we'll do some like car bombs or something mm. so I can incorporate like liquor <laughs> and beer. <laughs> there you go. But I'm not to, I'm not really great with that. So I'm more apprehensive to try to talk about it with somebody who doesn't know it. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now you got me thinking of like, uh, we got to keep this on video games because that's what we are. But I, I, mm. I, I, I'm thinking <laughs> of like um, an RPG like Final Fantasy V with a job system where you can your character's mm -hmm. class is either in wine or in IPAs or in lagers or in whatever different mm -hmm. kind of spirits. And then you, you know, there's like a, an alchemy system kind of like in Secret of Evermore, where you can put together drinks and stuff like that. Although I'm not sure how combat works, since you don't want to like 
use a drink as a weapon and throw it at them. You want to enjoy it. So I don't. I don't, so I don't know <laughs> we where I'm, make Molotov cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, but um, yeah, I just thought that was a cool idea for a game, and we should get started on that right away. Post haste, I you said <laughs> uh, the about the car bum earlier, and I I I think the the modernized term for that, I think people are calling it an Irish slammer these days. But I just want to point out, I, I actually I've been cleaning out, I cleaned out my my fridge in my game room because I needed to defrost the top out of it. So I was pulling my drinks out, and I had just enough Bailey's and just enough Guinness for one. And I was like, well, let's go ahead and get this done. You know, it was it was about eight a.m. on a Sunday. I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> there's no better time, and. I remembered that uh, when I was in college, my my wife, uh, but girlfriend at the time, had bought me a glass. She found some kids were just selling them on campus. And the cool thing about this glass is that the the big glass is has a magnet at the bottom underneath the underneath the cup, and then the shot glass also has a magnet, so they go together. So that when you do an Irish slammer and you tilt it back, you don't knock your goddamn teeth out with the shot glass. It sticks to the bottom. And everything else goes right down your gullet. How ingenious. Genius. <laughs> I love it. I thought Alex would be more impressed, but I, whatever. I'm confused. So what? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> How does it work again? So you, what goes down your gullet? The drink? <laughs> yes. <Just kidding. laughs> okay. Thankfully. Okay. So you're, you're not drinking the glass. You're drinking the liquor. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent on that. Which was the way it was always done. Oh, by the way, okay. I don't know if you yeah, knew that. I've part, had a but... drinking problem for many years now. Didn't. <laughs> that no, was pretty good. It wasn't. It was terrible. Uh, that might be the name of this episode. So, <laughs> so we've gone through. We've we've talked about your podcast, Pete's Power Hour, and all that stuff. So I guess we just. I have like one more formal question for you before we get into the emails. And and where where do you really where do you see yourself in about ten years? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> oh, well, I see myself as a leader in the company and oh my god, I hate this question so much. I have no a- I am not answering that question. No. Can I just say I'm sorry about that listeners? <laughs> I used to know somebody well, years ago that was so clueless um when it came to job interviews that he would answer questions like, "Okay, tell us a little about a little bit about yourself." Well, I have brown hair and blue eyes, <laughs> and you know I like to wear jeans. It it, it was like you're kidding me, like dude, that's <laughs> like I, so. Anytime I think of job interviews, and I think that's I did poorly, funny. like and I was like, well, at least I'm not that guy. <laughs> that's true. Okay. Who doesn't like to wear jeans though? Come on, try to stand out, be unique. But yeah, Michelle said not to ask her that question, therefore I had to do it. Let's get to some emails. We have an email here from a fellow network podcaster. The network is growing, everybody. We got Josh Leslie, also known as Frantic. He has the IndieQuest podcast, and of course he asks a question about indie games because I'm sure he wanted a plug for his show. There you go, Josh. He says, I know that Alex is a big fan of Stardew Valley, but my question is what other indie games have you guys played or enjoyed? Any recommendations or some on your backlog you'd like to mention? Thanks for the entertaining podcast, fellas. Josh Leslie, a.k.a. the Thirsty Logo Designer, which, again, thank you, Josh. Do I go first since he said my name? He did call okay. you out. Wow, yeah. he's, he's using the formal. So, yeah, my go-to for the past several years has always been Don't Starve because I really like uh, survival adventure games, and that's the type of game that, you know, you play as one... Me- meager little character and you're set out in the middle of this huge world that you're supposed to explore and find stuff to try and survive on and not starve obviously um it's i really like stuff like that just simple um it's it's brutally difficult because that game is ruthless but um that's always been a favorite of mine um as far as like the backlog um i really wanted to get into the game called cross code it's like a top-down uh action Mm -hmm. rpg sort of a deal uh, with a pretty elaborate combat system. I did put a little bit of time into it uh, a couple of years ago, but I really want to get into that one. That one looked really cool, and it has a lot of uh, good reviews too. So what about you, Petey? Mm, I would say my one of my most recent favorite indie games has been Battle Chef Brigade, which is on the Switch. It's like this little puzzle game that incorporates cooking. And any time, like if, if you put a mini game of cooking in any of your RPGs, I will 
be sucked in so fast and so hard it's not even funny. So my sister found this game that was like puzzle cooking and she was like, oh, maybe she'll like this. And I loved it. So nice. that's a little indie game, indie games that I, I liked. But probably on my backlog, I guess. I don't know if this counts as an indie game. Is the Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. It just came out on the Switch. Right. And I was trying to see if it was like by a smaller developer i mean it was like basically made by two guys but it, but it's by released by a larger group so i don't know if that counts as indie but i'm gonna say it's indie for the purposes <laughs> of this answer <laughs> fair works enough for me. works for me we'd have to let josh call us out and make make us feel bad about our answers so josh if you'd like go ahead and email drunk friend podcast at <laughs> um, my my favorite all-time indie game is super meat boy i'm a huge fan of that game i love the music it's a game i can revisit and i'm just never tired of it i love it um, I also like Cuphead. That was a game I, I enjoyed for a number of reasons. Pretty, fun, hard, all that stuff. Uh, but those are mainstream. That's not going to like be anything that is going to surprise anyone. But a game that I want to get to, and I, I want to play it because I think my wife, sometimes she enjoys uh, watching me play some like certain games. Um, and usually indie games, things like Gone Home or What Remains of Edith Finch, like stuff like that she kind of likes. And that's Firewatch. That's a game I've always wanted to to get into. I just, for some reason, haven't jumped in. But that's one that's on my radar. Firewatch. I have not heard of that one. Really? Mm. Yeah, I think it's yeah. it's kind of, uh, you know, there's the whole walking sim slash first person exploration indie game genre. And okay. for this one, I think you're separated from someone you're both in in firewatch towers like out in the you know it looks to me and i don't know a lot about the game i haven't played it but it looks to me like a pine forest and you're you're connected to one another via radios and there's some uh, relationship building that comes from that but there's also some things around that you have to explore and investigate and uh, i think it's just one of those kind of quick little stories that stick with you right on yeah sounds good to me yeah. Uh I'm going to butcher this poor fa- this poor fellow's last name but Marcus Morciel Morciel I think. Sorry Marcus. Uh he says <laughs> hi. I've been listening to this podcast since episode 5 I think and finally decided to write. Thanks for doing that. I really like what you guys do both in YouTube and podcast. Thanks for the good work. Thank you. So Nintendo decided to bring the original Fire Emblem NES translated to America for the first time. That's great, though it sucks it's going to be for a limited time. That does suck. Mm. My question is, what other NES and SNES games would you like to see translated and be available on modern consoles? Later, and greetings from Baja, California, Mexico. All right. I think, and I'm not I'm not as big of an expert in this domain as, as really you are, Alex. I'm just now getting into the whole the whole ROM hack thing. I finally have gotten to the point where I'm kind of comfortable exploring that space. And there's a ton, there's tons of translations out there for stuff. But if you're talking about like, you know, translating it and also making it widely available, i.e. not ROM hack type stuff, not translated ROMs. I think some of the big ones on the NES would have to be something like mother. Uh, there's an Akira game that could be cool. Uh, Sweet home is a big, important one. And these are games mm. I've not played obviously because I, they're in Japanese, and I've just gotten into the whole translation scene. And also a game that I read about a lot is called Radia Senkai, or Senki. Um, and th- those are all basically RPGs, or at least text-heavy NES games that I think would be really awesome to play if uh, if they were in English. So that's my answer. I'm going to go more SNES-heavy, I would, or Super Famicom, I guess. I would go Yay. Bahamut Lagoon. <laughs> Bahamut Lagoon. Uh, for sure, because I've never even, I don't know anything about it besides that it exists. Uh, Lennis 2, because I really like Paladin's Quest, the first game, a Ooh. lot. I would like to see Lennis 2, even though I know I could do it. I, like, I don't ROM hack at all, and I was actually thinking about venturing into it just to play Lennis 2 and asking you guys, like, so how do I play a ROM? Like, I, I have no <laughs> fucking idea. So, so I may ha- ask you down the road, how do I download this emulator into my computer without making it explode? And my third one, I guess, would be just to do a retranslation of almost anything by Ted Woolsey, but um, specifically Breath of Fire. Just because, mm. I mean, I love the Breath of Fire series, the first and second one especially so much, that I would like to see a better storytelling from it because Mm. even like the new port like the port that was done with like the game boy didn't have like 
really good localization. Uh, did it even improve the localization? I'm not even sure. Like, besides the fact that it just added running. So I would like a better translation for those games. Right. What, you're not happy with uh, items in your inventory called C-S-T-N and having yeah. to guess what they are and being like, uh, sea stone? Yeah. Like, and it turns out to be like some kind of like ice spell or something. <laughs> it's like, oh? Yeah. What? <laughs> I can yeah, tell you that- pretty bad. <laughs> there is a finished and fully playable retranslation for uh, Breath of Fire 2, um, but I don't think there's a there's anything for the first game, but but yeah, um, Bahamut Lagoon I would like to see get the Trials of Mana treatment and just get like a kind of a mm-hmm. remake from the ground up because I think and plus it's a Square game so I think that that's always a potential the potential is there. There's also a uh, rumor that uh, a game that I really like from Square called Live Alive is going mm-hmm. to get that treatment as well because they've trademarked the name down in Australia and like Southeast Asia and stuff like that. So I really hope that game gets it because it's a very unique... No, something can't be very unique. It's either unique or not. Come on, Alex. <laughs> it's a unique game. <laughs> it's it's one of those weird... It, it, it almost takes like the Mega Man format and makes it into an RPG where you've got seven different stories you can choose from at a menu at the beginning of the game and you can play them in any order. Um, so that's something I would love to see uh, reinvented. Not that it really needs it necessarily, but I think it would benefit from that treatment. Um, other than that, there's a bunch of games that still need translations. There's a beat 'em up called Shonen Ninja Sasuke or Sasuke for Super Famicom that is one of the most fun beat 'em ups I've played. It's like super fast and crazy, and uh, but it's kind of structured like Legend of the Mystical Ninja, sort of like a Goemon game because it's you got to go uh, buy stuff and talk to villagers in between levels. And I have no idea what I'm doing. But mm. uh, I really want that game in particular to get something. There's also weird games like there's a game called Zigzag Cat. That's like a <laughs> scrolling uh, uh, version of Breakout. It's like vertically scrolling and you're, you're like making stuff explode with your little dot thing that's actually a cat. It's, you know, it's Japan, but uh, <laughs> but it's there's all sorts of weird stuff like that that really needs a translation to make sense of any of it. Good answers. Yeah. That might be, that might be the best round of answers we've ever given on this podcast. Really? <laughs> I think so. We all came with something. It wasn't like, uh, I don't know. I don't normally play games that are like that. So, pretty good. Well, that's, that's usually what you do. I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Michelle, do you mind reading this next email? Hello again, drunk friends. I just finished listening to episode 33 of the podcast. Trav mentioned that he would be interested in asking a swimmer some questions. Ooh, I used to swim competitively from around middle school through college and even competed in a meet in South Korea. I'd be more than happy to answer whatever you throw at me. Keep up the good work with the podcast, and I hope to hear back from you. Thanks. 2D wizard or Joe, if you prefer. Very cool, Joe. Joe, if you'd prefer, yes. That's <laughs> awesome. I uh, I think it's cool that we had someone email and be like, hey, man, you guys should talk to swimmers. And then a swimmer emailed and was like, hey, man, you can talk to me. And I'm like, why don't you guys just talk to each other? I don't know what to ask a swimmer. <laughs> That's my thoughts exactly. Like, how about we just like, you know, your people will get in touch with their people and they can <laughs> set up a lunch date or something. And by the way, would you prefer to be called Joe or 2D Wizard? I think that's an interesting question. I think I like 2D Wizard better. <laughs> it's, it is fun. Yeah. Joe, I, I actually am curious. I mean, I might reply with a few, with a few questions and report back for the, sh- for the sake of the show. Just, just for the sake of the first email or curious about swimming and of course, to, to learn a little bit about what Joe's been up to here, because going international with your with your skills, he's got to be he's got to be pretty good. But the thing is, I'm going to have to brush up on what people interested in swimming want to know. Yeah, me too. That's a good good point. I would just want to know. You know, I want to be a good swimmer, um, because I've I've always been terrible at it. You know, going all the way back to what was it like junior high or grade school when we have to 
go swimming as part of gym class and then they separate everyone out into the skill level and I was in like the worst skill level it's just it never just it never clicked with me for some reason I just I I I I, I guess I would just want to know what the the basic form things you should keep in mind when you suck at swimming what should you you know keep in mind because when it comes to like something like running or jogging I'm always saying over and over in my head trust your form and that's you know making sure the middle of your foot hits the ground hits the pavement uh keeping your your shoulders back uh that sort of stuff you know and with swimming I wonder if there's something different if there's like a form I need to develop that I need to trust uh, so I know I'm doing it right, <laughs> but what is that form? I don't know what it would be. I guess it would be easier to explain in person, but I don't know. That's what I can think of for a question. Yeah, I'm kind. I'm kind of with you, man, because I think you know I grew up out in the mountains. There's not a lot of water around me. In fact, I'm I'm pretty far and protected from most natural disasters involving water. Uh, and I think that was by design. I think my ancestors decided we don't swim, so we're going to stay right here and we're not going to move. And let the water come to us. And we're going to be really high up in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've never been good at swimming. I remember going to the pool as a kid and swimming and seeing other kids swim. And I was like, I think I can do it. And got in there and did my damnedest, man. And I remember one time I was in the pool and I was like, all right, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm just going to, I'm going to kick my feet and I'm going to move my arms a lot and move my head and stuff. And then I looked up and I hadn't moved at all. I'd just been <laughs> splashing in place for like three minutes. And all the cute girls were like, no, thanks. You know, you're, you know, you're, you can't swim. And you look ridiculous. So, I don't know. It kind of ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> Same sort of deal for me. You know, I, I can relate to that, uh, you know, where I thought I'd try, you know, sw you know, like, all right, I'm going to do my damnedest. I'm going to dive underwater. And then I'm going to, like, do the thing where, where you, you spread your arms out and you try and, like, move through the water. And I get up mm -hmm. and I'm in the, like, I'm, like, three feet down. <laughs> <laughs> past where I was and I was 32 years old no I'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> so you guys uh, never like your parents never had take took you to swimming lessons or anything like that when you were kids no no my oh. the thing is though I think I've always preferred running though because if I get tired I can just like stop but if you're swimming and you get tired you stop you die <laughs> good point that's where I draw the line but no, I didn't. I wasn't much of a. We weren't amphibious people. Well, Michelle, did you did you take swimming lessons? Are you a fish? Oh yeah, my my parents had me and my sister in swimming lessons since we were like one or two up until we were like ten. I mean, wow. we weren't competitive at all. It was just for the purposes to learn how to swim so we wouldn't die. But yeah, mm. I would be curious to ask Joe like. At the competitive level, since I'm a very competitive person, like what was his routine in college as well as co competing internationally? Like how many hours in the pool did you have to spend in order to do that? That's that's what would be my question to him. Very good. Can you put these? Do you have more? Can you put them in a spreadsheet for me? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll share the spreadsheet. I need to get back with Joe. I need to have questions. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Please. Uh, no, that is a good question. I would be interested in that as well. I, I'm very naive. I'm Like I said, I'm so naive to swimming. I don't even know what to ask a good swimmer. So I know they eat a lot. Oh. Com really competitive guys eat a whole lot, right? Did Michael Phelps eat like a whole McDonald's one time? Yeah, because you're burning so many calories since it's an entire body workout. I mean, whether you're doing the breaststroke or freestyle or um, the backstroke. Why don't I mean, you different... interview him on your podcast? Oh, my God. <laughs> You guys don't know the different strokes and such for competitive swimming and whether you're a distance one or a sprinter like there's that's how Michael Phelps won so many war um, won so many medals is because he won the 400 the 40 the 50 like there's a freaking one hmm. for every measurement of meters. <laughs> so well, the only yeah. different strokes I know are Gary Coleman and Todd Bridges and, and Kimberly, <laughs> and Dana Plato. <laughs> that's that's uh. all I know, man. That got me pretty good. Oh, man. Very good. <laughs> very good job. Yeah. Good job, Joe. That's, that's actually very impressive. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. I'll ask a few questions. That's super impressive. Yeah. It's South Korea. Yeah, it is. Damn. All right. Up next, we got Mike from Connecticut. He says, hi, drunk friends. Wanted to drop you a message and say how much I am enjoying the podcast. I am a new listener in the past week and have absolutely been tearing through episodes. Thank you, Mike. 
Your conversation with Genovi about soda reminded me of this amusing picture, and Alex in particular might appreciate it. Now, I know that's not good podcast fodder, but I wanted to get Alex's live take on what he finds on this link. All right, I have not clicked on this yet. It's loading very slowly. You might want to finish reading the email <laughs> while it's loading because it's not it's it's blank so far. Okay. And okay, while Alex is waiting for that to load, he says, since it's the norm to ask questions, here goes nothing. What are your most satisfying video game boss fights you've ever played? And second question, what is your favorite non-video game to play any type of tabletop or party game? Thanks for all the great content. Best regards, Mike from Connecticut. Okay, real real quick, it, it did end up loading. Uh and it is a picture of like all the different generic <laughs> versions of Dr. Pepper, and it is delightful. How many? I had no idea there. What is there's one called just Country Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pig. Oh. <laughs> they Mr. Even, Pig. Like, Whole, ah. Whole Foods has their own Dr. Snap. Like they're I all the same that. color. That's impressive. Of course, yeah. Except Mr. for that Pig. one that's called Blue Something. Dr. We Becker. Doc- <laughs> Dr. Weiss. Uh, personally, I like Dr. Thunder because, you know, that's the Walmart brand right there. It's got to be. the wa- Or Super super Chill's not even trying. It's just like, yeah, <laughs> super it's chill. Uh, super chill, whatever. I like some that uh, have no reference to the drink. There's one just called, like, Dr. Weiss. Like, that's just a guy's name. That's not even fun. <laughs> Weiss is a store out in is oh. it's, out, it's out in your neck of the woods, isn't it, PD? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Weiss and um, Wegmans. Love me some Wegmans. <laughs> yeah, Doctor W is on here for Wegmans. Um, there's no Albertsons and there's no Smiths. I know, I know my grocery store chains, man. Oh, there's is Publix there on H-E-B? here, but that's just called Publix. I'm not seeing it. Mm. Huh. But yeah, this is delightful. Thank you for sending yes. this. It's <laughs> I I loved uh uh I've I've probably already t- I I know I've talked about this already, but my favorite of all time is is uh Mountain Lightning, <laughs> yeah. which is the uh Walmart brand Mountain Dew and it's just it was just rank, rancid. It smelled bad. It was just <laughs> awful. Yeah, it's it's it cured me of my soda addiction when I was a teenager. That's for damn sure. <laughs> that stuff was awful. I like. Uh, I'm also seeing the the two leaders over here, Doctor Bob and Doctor Fiesta. Those might actually be my favorite. All said, <laughs> Doctor Bob, <laughs> Doctor right. Party, but Mexican. <laughs> yeah. O- okay. <laughs> hey, sounds fun. Yeah, so he says, uh, what are your most satisfying video game boss fights you've ever played? Which is an interesting question coming off your recent video there, Alex. Do you have any that were most satisfying to come away victorious in? Um, The one that comes to mind right away is Giga Gaia and Chrono Trigger. Just because it's the first super challenging and involved fight in the game. At least I think so. Because I really had trouble with it. It took me like 20... 20 something minutes to to beat it the first time and I was like whoa I must be getting close to the end of the game cuz that was awesome um there was that um let me think boy I don't know you know there's always um one on one fighting games when it comes to be, you you finally get over the the hump so to speak against somebody like Vega who causes a ton of problems cuz he's so annoyingly fast or Sagat or getting past any of those folks is always like really satisfying. Um, just because it's it's just like a one on one fight and it's over within like you know less than thirty seconds. You just got to do the best you can. But um, I, I always enjoy that. But um, it's like the opposite of an RPG where it's like you got to do all this planning and strategy and it takes forever. And then <laughs> and then a role playing or and then a fighting game is like Bing Bang Boom done. So I I enjoy the satisfaction of like. Either getting the crap kicked out of me immediately or kicking the crap out of somebody immediately. There you go. Very good. I uh, I just talked about mine, actually, on the Polykill podcast, or one of mine anyway, my most recent one. I was playing this game that no one's ever heard of on the PSP called Chili Con Carnage. And the final boss in that game was, I mean, the, the whole game leading up to it was kind of, eh, it was mild in terms of difficulty. But oh, this boss. Mild. Were, oh, mild. It was a mild salsa. But Ouch. this, But this Chili Con Carnage boss ratcheted up with the chilies real spicy boss 
It was tough. <laughs> and but I was like, I've put in the time. I've put you know, I put six plus hours into this game. I, I'm not going to let the last five or six minutes deter me. Uh, but it took me like several hours to get my druthers together. And when I Damn. beat it, I like I got the last hit in right as I had like no health, and the it, the screen went black. It could have gone either way. I'm pretty sure the game did a coin flip and just gave it to him. He was like, all right, you, <laughs> you got it that time. But nice. But when it comes to retro games, I have two very memorable uh, beats. And that was those are Dragon uh, Double Dragon 2 and 3. These games are very tough. I mean, for me anyway, especially, because I'm not very good at games. But I was playing them with a partner, my friend Mickey. And he would come over. We scheduled this just so he could come over and play Double Dragon 2. It wasn't come over and drink beers and stare at trees and talk about life. It was, what time can you come play Double Dragon? He would just show up as an adult man a couple years ago, drive all the way from a town over, and we would just we just play it out, played them co-op. And so if you if you're familiar with Double Dragon, the co-ops are only four, two, and three. On, on the first one, you have to take turns. So two and three, you can play together. But each game has a special move that sort of makes the game not really easier, but it's definitely a strategy you want to incorporate. And the moves are always hard to do. So in the second one, you have to do the special knee kick. And you have to, you know, it's like, it's really touchy. It's like, you know, down and toward and A at the same time. And if you do that over and over, it one hits all of the enemies instead of continuously pounding on them and risk getting hit and all this stuff. So we make and it this to is the, the second one. Second one, yeah. is all okay. about the knee. We get to the, we get to the end, the final boss. And it's been a struggle. We're not, I mean, we have not been kicking its A. We, it's been, it's been uphill for several nights. Um, and, and finally we get to the end and, I, we've been there like a, probably at least 10 times, but I get that one knee in on the final boss and the screen freezes and goes black and white. And I remember as adult men, we jumped up and were giggling and hugging one another and jumping up and down in place <laughs> because it was such, I mean, it was like, it was such, it was like the miracle on ice, man. It was like we beat the Soviets. <laughs> we both had a little bit of a tear in our eyes and we celebrated. I ended up getting so drunk. I wasn't supposed to tell him this, but I was like, hey man, uh, my wife told me I couldn't say anything, but I'm going to be a dad. Just letting you know. I wasn't even supposed Aww. to tell him, but I got—I was so excited. I told him I was going to be a dad. Jeez. He came over the next time. We were going to start Double Dragon 3, and I told my wife, I was like, I might have let Mick know. And she's like, no. Well, tell him not to tell anybody. I was like, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. So he comes over, and I was like, hey, man, you know what I told you the other night? He didn't remember. I had to actually tell him again <laughs> to make sure he knew what I didn't want him to tell anyone. He was like, sorry, dude. I I was drunk, and we had just beaten Double Dragon 2. Like, that was way better than the news I gave him. So, good times. <laughs> but we ended up beating 3 as well, but it wasn't as as, in, as epic of a, of a form. But, yeah. So, <laughs> that's my story. Double Dragon 2. Good time. Fun no. times. Well, I like just bringing up Final Fantasy just to piss Trav off because I know he doesn't like Final Fantasy. So I'm going to bring up Final <laughs> Fantasy again because I, I swear this is I, I played more than Final Fantasy four, but as I'm just going to keep referencing it like the one that I remember being most satisfied with. And I don't mean satisfaction in terms of difficulty, I guess. It's just I remember the build and the and t like going through the fight was so great. Was the, you know, in the, uh, is it called, um, Calcabrina fight where you're fighting the little dolls and the boss, mu the boss oh, music yeah, doesn't yeah. even start off right off the bat. It's the creepy doll music that's kind of ballerina y. And you're fighting the little dolls and that ballerina sound. And then all of a sudden it merges into one evil thing and that awesome boss music comes in. Oh, it was <laughs> just, I loved it. Just that build up and then beating it was so great. Oh, that and then Uema fight. Uematsu. I, I don't know how to say his name properly, but mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, that guy really knew how to how to make a boss theme. Oh, best boss theme I think in any game is Final Fantasy IV. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, the bat the fight itself is not that hard, but the way it like told a story within the battle. Oh. Mm. <laughs> and it's that thing that looks like a it looks kind of looks like a baby almost. Yes, it's a and, creepy big baby doll. It's really yeah. ugly. <laughs> yeah, okay. I know what you're talking about now. Did he have another question? Um he says, "What is your favorite non-video game to play? Any type of tabletop or party game?" I just like uh occasionally I'll play like Texas Hold'em. Kind of fun sometimes. Um I'm not very good, but I remember um, years ago going to uh, a beach house 
with a whole bunch of other people all the way over in, oh, I, I'll never remember the name of it, but it's like on the coast of North Carolina. It was super fun because, uh, you know, we just like hang out and drink and be on the beach. I think I was like 24, 25. And then at night we would just play poker the whole time. And uh, I think there was like one, there was uh, one TV that had like um, an N64 and pe- some people would play Mario Kart. And then we, I was just like, screw that. It's N64. <laughs> Nuts to that. But, and then there was uh poker uh, and I got, I managed to almost win a hand. <laughs> like I, I never win hands, but, uh, or like at least like a, a big pot or anything like that. But I managed to get in the final two of one game, which was pretty cool. Yeah. I got, I got the floor wiped with me. I actually, I'm, I'm not big into anything that's cards or even competitive when it comes to like party games. I like things like cards against humanity where everyone's just kind of laughing. Like, cause if I, if I'm thinking and playing, then I get really focused and I'm not fun. I get really competitive. I start Mm. flipping tables and telling everyone, you know, who is pregnant (laughs) before I'm supposed to. It's a mess. (laughs) That's a good point, though. That's, uh, yeah, it's tough to separate fun, if especially if you're competitive like you two folks <laughs> apparently are. Evidently. Um, yes. Yeah. Michelle, do you have any uh, any go-to party games or tabletop stuff you're into? No, not really. Hmm. I don't party. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, I mean, if I was a kid, I'd be like, oh, man, Hungry Hungry Hippos? Like, does that count? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of does. <laughs> <laughs> but not not anything current. No, I mean I got Seinfeld Monopoly over there, but that's about it. <laughs> when you and your boyfriend, do you guys play games and is does it ever get heated? Do you guys ever play whip out the old Seinfeld Monopoly? We have before and usually it's not too competitive between us. It's very strange. Like we're not competitive with each other, mm. but we're very competitive people. Right, so you don't, don't want to push works. it. That makes sense. You're both respecting <laughs> it. You're like, if we if we take it to the next level, it's gonna there will be blood. There will be blood. We must keep it for fun. Mm-hmm. Good on you. That reminds me, when I first started dating Pearl, this would have been uh, like winter 2011. Um, we went someplace, and there was uh, air hockey, and I had not played air hockey for a really long time, um, and I, I got really excited, like, oh, let's play some air hockey, and Pearl was like, what's that? <laughs> and so we played for a bit and she kicked my ass, basically. <laughs> and I, a I girl. <laughs> I'm not gonna bit I'm not gonna lie, it kinda like bothered me at the time. I was like, fuck, I can't believe I I choked. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> I got I, I, I got just killed. I, I seriously lost like ten to three or something like that. Like I only scored like three goals or something. It was terrible. <laughs> um yeah. It's yeah. Good, good times, bad times. <laughs> good on Pearl. <laughs> yeah, that that reminds me. I remember my wife. I we've gone anytime we go on vacation, we always find like a, a mini putt place, and she has destroyed me every single time. And uh, after like the first couple, she was like, "I know you're just taking it easy. You can, re- I mean, you can, you know." She was. I couldn't tell if she was saying that because she really thought I was, or if she was like giving me like a pat on the shoulder, like, "You know, you got it, big guy." But either way, I was like. No, I'm trying my best. You're you're just really good. I must be strong arming it or something because I'm so strong. I don't know what it is. It's just hard. Wait a second. When you when you talk to your wife playing mini golf, you sound like uh, Hank Hill all of a sudden. I do. She finds it to be very strong. She thinks it's burly. Yeah. Propane and propane accessories. Yeah, she's into it. Oh yeah. <laughs> big big Mike Judge fan. My wife. Oh, love no, Mike Judge. No, just my dumb voice is just a variation of Brian Regan and drunk. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like sounds like good old hank yeah, yeah actually it does uh all right yeah thanks mike those are good questions um email again sometime why don't you okay so we have some listener questions i think these are coming from maybe the patreon over there at the snest drunk patreon i'm not real sure uh but yeah yeah okay cool uh the first one here comes from trevor he says uh what is a game in your favorite genre that you just don't like for whatever reason Go ahead, PD. What's your least favorite Final Fantasy game? <laughs> <laughs> there is none because uh, no, I I haven't played all of them. But no, my favorite genre is JRPGs, obviously. And my least favorite, I'm gonna say two. Uh, any Dragon Quest game because I I don't know why I just can't get into them. I don't know if it's the art style, the music, hmm. like it's just I'm not I can't. 
like even the most recent one I know, they're all apparently really great. I just something about them. I just can't even like start them. And then the second answer is Saga Frontier, which was on the PlayStation. I tried playing that game back when I was a teenager and I just couldn't figure it out. And I'll probably get gripe. Like, how can you not figure this game out? I don't know. I couldn't get past, like, you can character select at the beginning of the game. And first off, the like, the sprites were just, like, chunky and awful looking. So I was like, I'll pick this blob. And picking that blob, couldn't figure out what the hell to do. So then I'd start over, pick another blob. Couldn't figure that out. I'm like, well, great. I'm just off to a great start here. I don't know why. It's in English. I don't understand why I can't figure this out. Like, I know how to play a video game, I think. But this game broke me. So I need to revisit it as an adult, a mature adult now. But <laughs> <laughs> a supposedly mature. I'm just kidding. Supposedly. Um, <laughs> for me, I was, I was going to say, have you played Unlimited Saga? Because that's even like Mm -mm. worse that's the one that came later for i think ps2 and it's a disaster like they try and like reinvent the wheel and it's it's awful it's not good it's one of the worst uh rpgs ever really i think when it's all said one of the worst games like square ever put out i would say um so uh, and i i don't remember off the top of my head what um Saga Frontier is like, but I think I remember that one getting crappy reviews too. It so, should. You're not alone there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what mine would be. I've I've been thinking about this one. I don't even know what my favorite genre would be. It is I guess it would be RPGs since I spend the most yeah. time with those, but that's only because they're that's only because they're long. It's like you, you can't play those without spending a lot of time with them. <laughs> that's fair. I don't know. I'll just say that a game I'm supposed to like that I don't is Demon's Crest mm. because it's supposed to be like a uh, Super Metroid style, like exploration, go, you know, backtrack, unlock something, go back and find it. It just falls flat to me. I don't like the music. I don't like the structure. I think it's tedious and kind of boring. Um, but as, as I guess it's kind of a Metroidvania style game and it, I'm just not feeling it at all what about you trav i like all the games you're talking about i like demon's crest i like dragon warriors so i feel personally attacked also like vodka so this is a day where we just don't like anything travis likes and that's okay i can deal with it i'll cry later but i think uh when i think about what i like you brought up a good point like i don't know what genre i'm attached to it depends on i guess the time and space i think at one point i was just purely a sports guy and then one point i was this and one point i was that um, I guess now I'm kind of an action RPG guy, and I really liked the Shining games on the on the Genesis, especially Shining Force One, Two, great games. But then I tried to play Shining Soul on the whole Game Boy Advance, not good. Mm. And I played both of them and beat both of them, and they were just awfully boring, hack and slash tactical RPG type things. So those were ones where I was like, oh, it's Shining, it's got to be good. No, not great. So I did not know there was a Shining game on Game Boy Advance. That's interesting. And there's a sequel too. Yeah, Shining Soul One and Two. They're huh. just they're not the they're not the turn based tactical strategy games that you're accustomed to. These are action based RPGs, very simplistic and kind of aggravating. <laughs> honestly, yeah, that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Like, why use the shine? Well, I know why you use the shining game to, to, to name to get attention, but pretty much that's pretty lousy. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. This one's from Pedro. He says, "What do you name your RPG characters? Do you stick with the default names, or do you come up with your own?" I uh, I name mine after I start with my cats, <laughs> and the, it, it's funny actually. This is another thing I brought up on the recent Polico podcast. I, I end up naming things after my, my pets. So the first one is always Ralph. That's my cat. The second one's Leonard. That's my wife's cat. The third one now is is my daughter, Ella. Back when my dad's dog was alive, I would go with Toby. And if it extends beyond that, I just start putting my friends in there at some point. But I feel like I always have to name them. I can't just let it be the default. Because once I start, I can't just have half half named and half default. That doesn't feel right to me. But what really <laughs> sucks about all of this is that if I ever need to consult a walkthrough, I have no idea 
what the <laughs> fuck they're talking about. They're like, take Nimbleheim to the inn. And I'm like, I have no idea who they Is that Ralph or Leonard? I don't know. I got to go ask my Especially- cats who they are. <laughs> especially Final <laughs> Fantasy 6 and stuff like that where it's like yeah. then you you want to split your parties like at the end of the game you want oh, you want to yeah. pick a uh, Gao, <laughs> Cyan and and Setzer and it's like wait who are they again yeah the yeah. the worst one was Wild Arms too you name like 26 characters i was digging through yearbooks to think of people and then <laughs> i would go consult the walkthrough and i'm like i have no idea who you're talking about so, yeah yeah it was tough what about you guys Playthrough number one, I go for default. If there's no default, then I'll come up with my own. And playthrough number two, I'll come up with my own names. And typically, like, so I'll use my own name, but in my family, in my immediate family, um, my mom, my mom is from the Philippines and Filipino culture, you have a lot of nicknames. So I am also known as not only as PD, but I have like several nicknames as well as my sister. So I'll use our nickname, our Filipino nicknames, and start put, <laughs> plugging them into RPG. So I'll put in Tubby, Boo Boo, Bikyat. I'll throw in my boyfriend. I'll say Hopper. <laughs> All these like little fun nicknames. I'll start throwing them in there like that are associated with us. Oh, huh, interesting. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. yeah. I like Tubby a lot. <laughs> Tubby, yeah, that's that's gonna play well usually in a in a JRPG. Um, <laughs> for me, I like I I usually go with default, like my first playthrough, like you said. I don't know why. Um, I just like you know I feel like I'm uh, an observer and part of the story, you know, observing the story, uh, you know, just kind of soaking it in that way. But um, with with a game I've played a few times, like Chrono Trigger. I do I do stupid stuff with the name like uh, I love playing with Frog's name. I'll name him like a different animal. Like he's <laughs> you know this oversized frog, but his name is Fish or something stupid, <laughs> something stupid like that. And and I love how Chrono Trigger especially has like all those extra characters. Like it's got you know exclamation points and pluses and dashes, and it's like why would these be here? But yeah, I just remember my friend in high school named i just came up with the dumbest possible names for everybody i think isla's name was like oral plus or something like that (laughs) and uh uh, robo's name was vibro i forget who else what else he did uh i think chrono's name was something stupid too but it, it made us laugh and at the end of the day that's what it's all about is all about laughter right it is i think yeah is that it? <laughs> Are you done with the episode? No, I mean, it's... it's. Oh, that is it. Okay. No, I, I didn't mean that <laughs> to sound that way. I was like, do we have another question? No, that's right. There's only two. <laughs> yeah, it is only two. I want to thank Michelle for, for joining us on the show. And I want to also thank her for ever reaching out with that email and becoming a good friend of ours. And um, I, I encourage everyone to go check out Petey's Power Hour. Uh, you can find it on polykill.com. You can just search Petey's Power Hour. I think it should come up. That's P-E-T-E-E apostrophe S Power Hour, which is actually in- m- interesting, Michelle, because I associate Power Hour with beer. Is it, is it also a wine thing? Do people gather around for an hour and just pound wine? I mean... Didn't you ever do it with shots? Power hour of shots? That's actually, that's a good point. That's a good point. (laughs) I might edit that out. Very good. Um, All right. (laughs) Well, yes, shots. What are those? You just drink straight from the bottle. (laughs) Yeah, I know. We don't do shots anymore. We're classy. (laughs) I mean, if you own the bottle, just put your mouth on it. Okay. Oh. By the way, you can just go to polykill.com because somebody re- reorganized this website oh. and did a nice job. Um, you can just go to polykill.com and it's pretty much up front and center. Uh, PD's py- Power Hour with uh, a very nice logo made by uh, our good friend Josh Leslie. Yeah, that will. He made the the drunk friend logo, but who made your logo, Michelle? Isn't that Josh? Nope. <laughs> That's not Josh, but it looks something like exactly like something he would make. No, my sister drew my logo. <laughs> Aw. Yeah. Well, she did a great job. It looks awesome. I like it, uh, that your sock is kind of weird looking. Yeah, that is colorful. So- it's, I told her, I was like, I want fun socks because I love fun socks. She goes, okay, does this work? I'm like, yes. <laughs> More brighter the better. Wow, I had no idea. 
Yes, fun socks. Well, it's confusing because her sister's name is also Josh Leslie, so it's it's a whole mess. It's hard to, you have to kind of. Damn it, that's where I got tripped up. Yeah, you gotta have push pins and yarn to figure all this out. It's weird, but I could have swore it was him. Oh well, I remember. I, I I thought he like came in the room one day and was like, maybe he was just like showing it off because he liked it, but I thought he did it. But okay, never mind. My fault. Yeah, we can't give him credit for everything. He's he does a good job though. <laughs> Shout out to Josh for the drunk friend. Yeah, we're Welcome. we're spending way too much time on this Josh guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You sent an email. What more do you want from us? Jesus Christ. God. All right. So that's been another drunk friend podcast. As always, you can reach out to us with more questions or comments at drunkfriendpodcast at gmail dot com. We might even read it out here on the show as we did with four of them here today. If you want to hear more podcasts from our crew, as Alex alluded to, you can head over to polykill dot com. That's P O L Y one L Kill kill has two com and poke around and if email's not your thing that's no big deal if you still want to contribute and uh just you know interact uh you can leave us a rating and review on a podcast app of your choice and that'll help us out right on you can find us all on social media i'm on twitter at traff plays games alex you can find him everywhere of course at snest drunk and michelle you have a couple twitters a couple instagrams how can people how can people locate you in the show um, you can find me on Twitter at PD's Power Hour, for sure. Cool. Uh, Trav spelled <laughs> it wrong on here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. He left it. He left an S out. It's like, how do you spell That's power? Like... Okay. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> As all. <laughs> yeah, go in and fix it now. Nice, nice job. Good job. As always, we want to shout out the show's theme, composed by our friend Coolor. The track you hear is called Electric Star Bounce, and you can find a link to more of his music on the Buzzsprout podcast page. We also want to thank Petey's sister, Josh Leslie, for our <laughs> thirst-quenching logo. Uh, and I want to thank Kular, too. He did the uh, intro, the music to my show as well. So yay, Kular. Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he did, the, he did the music to Polykill as well. Round, round of applause for Kular there. Uh, be sure to catch us all on YouTube, and thanks for listening. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Cheers. Cheers.